Okay, so I guess well, let's just introduce the topic to start off with. Um, so thanks, Thomas, for doing this um, webinar this evening. Um, so obviously, we're, we're trying to build these Omnos webinar series for um, educational purposes and to build an academy. And today we have um, Thomas Olivia, the CEO of Omnos. Um, I'm Hannah, so I'm the Partnerships Manager and I'm also a registered associate nutritionist. Um, I personally have a um, lot of interest in this area because um, I, I studied it um, as part of my master's. And Thomas, you've obviously got at least 10 years of experience working in the field and um, so, um, yeah, from, from now on, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much. So, yes, today we're going to talk about what is epigenetics, because it's quite misunderstood. Uh, it's also quite new. Uh, I mean, new. It's getting mainstream. Um, but we're going to learn today on why your genes are not your fate and actually what you can learn about doing something about your genetic makeup. Uh, obviously, you cannot change your genes, and we're going to learn that, but you can switch on and off certain genes. Uh, and so you change the expression. So let's start uh, with some theory here and how epigenetic works, OK? So it's very important. And the first thing, actually, is to understand that you are the designer in a sense that we too long thought that you were set to get certain type of diseases, um, but it runs in the family. We all heard the story. Um, but actually, the reality is what you will have in your age from the family uh, will, is more likely to be the habits. Uh, obviously, the genes, yes, but it's actually the, your lifestyle, your diet, and your environment that will dictate the results. Um, so it's very important to understand this because from this standpoint, you are going to move from being quite reactive towards your health to are being proactive towards your health. And that makes a massive difference. Because now we can say that in that um, mindset, your health is your responsibility. And actually, every day, every single occasion you have, um, in the interactions, you need to understand that your genetic is uh, your, your epigenetic is actually in dialogue with your environment, your lifestyle and your diet. So you are building and becoming um, your, your, your genetic makeup, if you wish. So it's very important to, to, to understand all this. Um, and here I'm, I'm talking about a bit like Mozart, you know, you, you, can, you can sort of compose your health on a daily basis by making the right choices or the wrong choices. So this is why we say your health is your responsibility. So that's an important one. Before we go into explaining everything on certain area of your health and, and how you can, based on specific genes, um, do specific life hacks, uh, things to do or things to avoid, um, let's try to understand a bit of the basic of genetic and I will try to make this um, not like I was going to be your, your biology teacher but a bit more exciting um, and try to take you a bit on a, on a journey here. So the first thing is what DNA stands for, right? Um, so it, it's very uh, obviously very, very, um, well most people understand what DNA is but um, just to let you know, uh, I'd like to actually take you on a, on a little journey here where to, for you to understand how big this is. So what you have in your body is just amazing. It's not short from being actually amazing. So I'd like you to imagine that in your body, you have 37.2, not million, but trillion, not even billion, but trillion cells. And each of, in each of every of those cells, you have uh, what we call a nucleus. And uh, so zoom in to this cell, zoom in this nucleus, and this is where you're going to find nicely wrapped up your DNA, right? Which is a bit of this uh, genetic ladder, so this ladder here. But what is very just incredible is the amount of it um, that is nicely wrapped up. You have enough to go in each individual in one cell, and remember you have 37.2 trillions of them, 
you have six foot tall of DNA, nicely wrapped up. So obviously is nature ingenuity of how it's wrapped up. We not really know yet. I mean, we do know, but how it's made to be six, six foot tall of DNA is just sensational. So it's enough to give you, you know, an idea to give you things in perspective. It's enough to go to the sun and back 600 times. So you have that amount of DNA in, in you, yourself as an individual. So that's why it's quite exciting. And that's why a lot of people try to dig into this and try to understand what it means. And what they have done is to look at the genome. The genome is the sum, the complete set of your DNA. And the genome, the genome project uh, was something that was completed uh, after 10 years. Um, and it costs 3.2 billion to sequence the whole genome uh, at first. And now you can do the same thing for less than a thousand pounds, thousand dollars actually. Uh, and what is exciting again is we understood from there that we have sort of cracked the code of life. Uh, and this is the exciting bit. So understanding that we were going to see all those uh, different um, different terms like a base pair, what they are and all these things, but I will make this simple. So the base pair is basically the code of your DNA. Okay, so your DNA, you have genes and we're going to see what genes are. Um, and they have four letters. Uh, what we call the base pair, A, C, G, and T. And this is really the language of your DNA. So if, if I take my phone or any of the screen here, you have a binary language, which is one and two. Um, in your body, you have four letters, A, C, G, and T. Obviously, we, we put those later, but um, it, it, this is how we're going to describe it. The nucleotide is basically each of them. So this is what the, the DNA is composed, the gene is one base, uh, of sugar, phosphate, and that's your, your nucleotide. Um, and that's what put together this beautiful uh, uh, helix, the double helix. Now, another term that is quite important is replication, um, is when those DNA divide, so cells divide actually, and it copies, copy paste. Uh, keep copy pasting uh, the, the, the code, the information to create the things you need to create. So let's say, uh, for example, you're losing hair and you grow more hair, or you're losing bone and you grow more bones. Your DNA is in charge of doing all those different things. They have the code to do that and the building blocks to give um, information to your proteins and then the sort of building blocks uh, doing all those things and they're built. So this is what DNA does, is to give the information to build. So now the genes, you can see a gene like a, a sentence. So it's a long sentence. You have genes quite, quite short, others are very long, um, and they are made up obviously of, of DNA. Um, and you have more than two millions of them. Uh, we have two copy of each genes uh, from each parent. Okay, so you get from uh, genes from your parent, from your mother, and from, from your father. Now, this is where it becomes interesting because we have um, the SNP, okay? And you have actually, we are all identical in the sense that we are 99.9% .9 identical in terms of DNA. But remember how this is big in terms of volume of it, right? But this 0.1%, it what makes us different from person to another. And what is fascinating is, based on the differences. So let's say Hannah here has blonde hair. So there's certain genes for coding for hair colors. Um, she will have, a, this is where the base pair letter are important. She will have, have maybe a, a TT variation that makes blonde hair. I will have a AA variation that makes brown hair. But it's also very true when it comes to not only the traits, but the things like how you're going to detox certain, um, certain toxins, right? How are you going to absorb certain nutrients or how are you going to transport them or assimilate them? And all of this can be very different from a person to another. And those SNPs is uh, to make it short because single nucleotide polymorphism is not you know, easy to say. Um, those SNPs is what code for something. So there's only 0.1% that code for something. The rest is actually 
things that are not coding for anything, right? Uh, I mean, they do, but for a long time, we are calling this junk DNA. It's definitely not junk DNA, but see it as archive of the evolution or um, all those different things. But the SNP is what is important because this is what will make the difference from a person, an organism to another. And understanding this difference is something we can do now. And this is the exciting things because you can really understand through genotyping, understand what your SNPs are, um, what makes you different and what you can do or to prevent certain disease or, or to optimize your health uh, or all those things. So the alley, um, to make it simple, um, is to describe all the variation amongst the genes. Um, so is how the, the, the variation non-coding DNA sequence. So now let's go into other terms, so like genotype. Um, a genotype is basically what you inherit from your parents and is the, the SNPs position, okay? Um, a phenotype is the two LRA inherited from each parent again, but certain state position plus the epigenetic and all the environmental factor. So maybe Anna, you have an example of what would be a phenotype to explain a bit more. Yes, yeah, so, um, so essentially your genotype is the is what your what the coding is within the body and then your phenotype will be how you present to the world so that can be your eye or hair color is a phenotype and um, but also things like your health status your body weight your even things like your taste preference that can be a phenotype so it's essentially how your body is reading the the code and then presenting it and this can be influenced um, well, a lot of the time influenced um, by things like environmental factors. Obviously, yeah. the eye, eye color won't, won't change as such, but um, but yeah, hopefully that gives a bit more. So to, to, for you to understand a bit, a bit further, we have here um, um, an example of identical twins. So let's say identical twins have the same genotype, um, but let's say both were separated at birth. Uh, one twin, is now in a circus. I'm making things up, so don't, you know, don't worry. Um, but goes in a circus and is very active, um, end up eating very well, has a good environment, um, sunlight, you know, like good, good um, uh, um, lifestyle. The other twins is um, a successful lawyer, but works 12 hours a day in front of a computer, sit too much, eat processed food, um, and um, yeah, just very stressed out. Um, based on the genotype they have, let's say they are predisposed to type two diabetes and, and condition with heart wellness. The person who is in the circus is quite less likely to have those issues. But the person who is stressed out, working too much, sedentary lifestyle, eat um, a diet which is uh, you know, process is quite likely to develop all of those things. So right now, it means that the phenotype, the environment have shaped and switch off, switch on or off the, the gene to express. And this is why we call, uh, we, we talk about epigenetic here, is how your lifestyle, your diet, your environment will put certain tag on those genes to express. Right, so this is the next slide, actually. Um, so you need to understand, uh, and this is quite a, a nice little picture here, is everything you do is, it's like your experience you have with your environment is actually um, being registered by your biology. And that's evolution. It's an evolutionary thing because we adapt to our environments and we keep evolving. We're still becoming, we're human becoming. We're not we really human being, we're still becoming. So it's very important to understand that Anything you do when it comes, you know, food choices or your environment, or you will have uh, your, your, your put epigenetic tag. So one good example is, for example, obesity, which in the rise, and sometimes you see children, um, um, children actually being born pretty much obese and having conditions, which is 
doesn't really much make sense because actually it's the epigenetic because the epigenetic the parents will have put tags and what will happen then is you 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 would evolve this way and you're quite more likely to have epigenetic tag to become obese let's say or have type 2 diabetes predisposition so so this is what is important to to understand here is you can set the scene for yourself but also for the generation after that that's the fascinating things about uh, epigenetic so gene variation and uh, gene mutation are a bit different but we're going to talk about this just to make a difference the gene variation um is what actually so let's say the snip for uh, a gene for detoxification um your gene variation is not optimal that will make you not being able to process certain toxins properly so you will not be as efficient as removing toxins or or this enzyme will not be working optimally um so yeah and the gene mutation is a bit different is when um the the code actually change so instead of is this like there, there will be a typo and there's an error and then the replication uh, goes wrong and this is where mutations is is usually something that is created in the environment a good example is people will be uh, radiated uh, let's say let's you know through, with radiation will change radiation actually will change will make the dna unstable and we'll have a lot of those replication that will go wrong so you'll have gene mutation and this is what goes wrong in the body and everything break down so yeah this was quite a bit of a dark example apology <laughs> but uh, yeah this is how it works and then the big difference to understand all this is your your genes are set you cannot change your genetic but you can change the expression of your genes okay however the and this is what we do at home loss and this is why it's important to understand that everything works together if you are predisposed to let's say have a bigger requirement because of certain gene um, of i don't know vitamin d so the vdr genes which has to do with how you're going to absorb vitamin d this is not working optimally you then need to check what is your biomarker your biomarker is what is actually right now within your blood okay or urine or any tissue sample uh, but it will tell you what is the level of, of it so if you're predisposed to be low in vitamin d and you live in a country where you don't have much sun exposure um, you're quite likely to be during winter time too low and that's why you need to maybe track this biomarker and if this is less than let's say 40 in you it's it's not a good thing at all because you there's actually studies showing now that you're 14 times more likely to have serious illness um, if you're as low as that so you're more likely to be low on vitamin d so you should as knowing this you should make sure to have a, a greater intake maybe supplements in vitamin d during winter time and check your biomarkers to see if your level are within ranges or optimal right so this is what should we should be doing hope it makes sense so far you can leave questions and i, I can see there's a few questions here uh, so the, all the questions we will uh, have a look at the end uh, and we can answer all this uh, anything you want to add anna um only that um to kind of i mean obviously it might you know if people have questions like you say um drop them in the, the chat box but um one thing that i found quite useful to uh, conceptualize um how your genetic variation can make a, a difference on you as a person so if you have one type of um gene and you have what it can be termed a kind of a risky allele so um you know the version of a gene that is associated with a, a kind of a risk factor so for example the obesity gene if you are known to have the like the risky allele so the risky version of that gene then it's not that you're going to have obesity it's kind of that that is going to give you um, things like a higher appetite and you're going to have um, you're going to be have 
more focus on food and you're going to have high so you know it, it is actually then linked to other genes and they all kind of interact together yeah. um but yeah so it's it's the reason why people's do because obviously that having blue eyes or, or brown eyes isn't going to have a um a ri- you know that's not risky or non-risky but um you know when I think about okay is this going to be associated with a risk factor I think yeah. of it, this is a risky version of that gene I don't know if that kind of it's a very important point actually you you shouldn't we shouldn't look at a gene in isolation and this is what in almost we have cluster in certain category of genes and we start using something called the polygenetic score in a sense that is the sum of all those genes in the subcategory that matters so mm-hmm. obesity is a good one fto genes so you know it doesn't mean you're going to be uh, linked to obesity but if you have uh, appetite uh, or eating dissolved like eating behavior genes like mc4r which is has to do with like uh, the regulation of your appetite um, mm-hmm. if those genes express as well it will make you more likely to wanted to snack more and because you have these FTO genes it can be a bit of a vicious circle so then you should be making sure of um, you know making changes into your um, mindful eating for example would be a good thing for you and, and trying not to snack or trying to reorganize things I, I have this gene I have the MCM4 and if there's a buffet in front of me uh, <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm just kidding myself and it's not a good thing so uh, but I know that so I try to avoid this type of scenario anyway so Unlocking your bio-individuality, this is where it's very interesting to, um, to understand, again, that once you start knowing certain area of your health and your, what is your genotype, um, so we're going to have a look at a, a, a few areas here. So, for example, um, when it comes to predisposition to certain diseases, um, there's a lot of area here that are quite important. Um, and we will not going to go through all of them, uh, but on the platform, we go through all of those and even more, a lot more. Um, but it's very <laughs> important if we talk about heart wellness, for example, or brain health, uh, if we talk about uh, insulin resistance, type two diabetes, those are things that are very common and they're actually preventable even reversible for type 2 diabetes. So it's very important to understand if you do have those predisposition and it runs your family, you can do something about it. And you can actually, uh, by adapting your lifestyle, your diet, your environment, your genotype, you can actually switch off those genes to express, and that's epigenetic, right? Yeah, and, and actually kind of going back to, I know we were, we were, you're going to give some really good examples in a bit, but um, just a bit more background, again, using the obesity gene um, and the FTO gene, um, what they found is that if you have, um, say, a child that has this particular genotype and they are very active as a child, then they're lo- much less likely to have the phenotype of being obese when they're, you know, at, when, when they're an adult. And they can be something something really you know when I say simple but something like that that can actually change whether or not you, you know your body you, you yeah you um then have the kind of the, the associated risk with it and it's the same you know thing with with heart health you might have a few risky genes but actually if you change certain behaviors you can then kind of prevent that um from yeah. happening or even as you you mentioned it, it kind of slow down this expression of that gene yeah and there was actually a very large study which is was the sort of first one about epigenetic it's called the dutch study and it was shown that after the war uh, the second world war there, there was uh, a bit of famine in in, um, in netherlands and the, the the young actually later grew out to have a much stronger immune system than the generation after and before because of the famine, because the, 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 the hardship of their environment obviously had, had an impact on their epigenome. So that's how it works, its evolution. Right? Mm. So to give another example. So let's move on into um, looking at a few of those areas. Um, we're going to discuss 
on how it all works and also what can you do about it, okay? So just a quick reminder about those letters, ACGNT, adenine, guanine, uh, cytosine, and, and thymine. Um, it is the language of your genes and SNPs. And based on those variations, so let's say uh, I, I'll take, um, I don't know, let's say here on heart health, um, we are going to talk about all those different genes here, don't worry, we're not going to go one by one. Um, but let's say I'm taking, um, I don't know, uh, APOE here has to do with uh, fat absorption, for example, lipid metabolism. Um, this gene, if you have, uh, if, well, actually it's a bit different. Uh, if you have a e E4, let's say a, a variation or a E3, this one is different. I picked up the wrong one here. <laughs> uh, but if you have an E4 or E3 variant, uh, it's different. If you have the E4, you're more likely to have high cholesterol. Uh, you're more likely to not respond very well long term on having too much saturated fat in your diet. So, for example, for the people who have this type of variant, this gene variant, a keto diet is not necessarily the best thing for them. And so following the trend of the ketogenic diet is has many benefits, but you will need to adapt to your own genetic makeup, right? Uh, and that's how it works. Um, I say I'd, I'd jump in there quickly because yeah. there's also some research to show that if, you know, talking about that same gene that you're talking about, Thomas, um, it, you know, we, we kind of talk about how... Um, Omega-3 oily, well, like omega-3 is what you'd find in things like oily fish. Um, normally that's very good for your heart health, but if you have particular genes, so this FRE4, that can actually ha still have a negative impact on your um on your on your cholesterol essentially. So yeah. again, that's it kind of shows the importance of some, you know, some genes and how actually um by knowing it you can kind yeah. of modify it. actually even do webinar, another webinar at some point. <laughs> Just on FRE4. <laughs> debunking the one size fits all diet um, yeah. which is something i used to do because again based on your genotype you cannot follow trends so let's say um i'll give you more example if you want to be a, a vegan if you have um a gene um to do with omega-6 omega-3 rich ratio um, if your gene is not optimal here you will be lacking of the omega-3 and be creating inflammation because the ratio is wrong. So you cannot be an healthy vegan, except if you adapt somehow by supplementing with omega-3. So there's all those different things that you, you would need to, to, to learn um, on, on how you can adapt, right? That's because some people will thrive on a ketogenic diet, others won't, uh, and the same for vegetarian diet or, or others, right? Uh, and then there's all the food intolerances. So it's important to understand all those different things. Anyway, Let's go back into heart health here. So you can see there's quite a lot of them uh, of those genes in, in relation to heart health, and there's more, but um, you know, those are the, the main one. Some has to do with oxidative, oxidative stress. Some have to do with inflammation. Um, all the things that will have an impact on your heart wellness. Um, how you're going to even respond uh, to certain, uh, with uh, those genes here, uh, to certain uh, medicine. So it's important to maybe look at all those things and see how you, you respond to that. And based on your genetic variant, based on your genotype, uh, then on the platform, we give you recommendations. So things to do for heart wellness, for example, could be uh, um, 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 a diet rich in omega-3, for example, uh, cutting for sure all the process Fat uh, will be a good, a good thing. Um, removing uh, all the pro-inflammatory food. So we're talking about, um, you know, for example, damaged oil, like rapeseed oil, uh, sunflower oil, you know, things that you fry. Uh, so, you know, all the processed foods, you, you, you will find this. Um, and go obviously for food that are a lot more rich in, in, uh, in, in antioxidant. Uh, so th this is the sort of things you can do. Um, anything you want to, to add? I mean, there's many examples and we, we give all those recommendations on the platform based on 
your genetic variants will give you the exact recommendation. But there's plenty, but you want, you want to add anything, Anna? Um, not right now, no, not for this one. Thank you. Okay, so brain health. So for example, <coughs> brain health is dependent of so many things. And we understand things like dementia, Alzheimer, are very much multifactorial. And that's not only just things happening in your brain, it will have an impact from your uh, toxins in your body, um, inflammation, right? And we'll see in details what inflammation is, um, but also how you're going to be predisposed to neurotransmitters. So um, how things are, your vitamin Bs, how you process all those things. Uh, and then, um, even insulin resistance, so type 2 diabetes, uh, sometimes, a lot of times actually, um, insulin will, <coughs> will be called, I mean, the, um, Alzheimer can be called type 3 diabetes. So depending on where it's coming from, those imbalances will have an impact on your, on your brain health. And this is all, again, the genes that have impact. So for example, the COMT genes here, we call it the warrior or the warrior genes. Uh, if you have the TT variant, for example, like I have, you're more likely to have a stress response, a greater stress response, and you're more likely to be a warrior. Uh, and if you have the A variant, you, you don't have that. Um, the, the GSTM1 here has to do with toxins. So it's um, how you going to process glutathione, which is in your phase two of detoxification pathways. But we're going to have a look at that after. Um, and uh, yeah, so all the CYP families, the mainly phase one detoxification, uh, SOD2 has to do with oxidative stress. So oxidative stress is something that your body creates naturally. Um, any interaction creates oxidative stress. <clears throat> but if you have too much of oxidative stress, let's say very common for athletes, um, that, and um, you know, sometimes drops of a heart attack or have issues in, in the longer longer run um, because of too much of oxidative stress. So we know from uh, ultra performer, uh, like uh, um, triathletes, and it's, there's too much oxidative stress for their body to, to cop. And that's why more, they're more likely to, to have issues in the long term if you, they don't have a rich antioxidant diet to remove this oxidative stress and, and reduce the inflammation. So a few examples to do here for brain health. Um, again, brain is a bit like a muscle. It needs oxygen. It needs um, exercise. Um, and we do need to think of it this way. And obviously, the good quality fat is very important for the brain. Um, and uh, you want to avoid, uh, as I said, all the toxins that will damage. You want to regulate your insulin because that will have an impact on your brain health um so yeah this is the sort of things you can do things to take is very uh, you know different for supplements they're all sort of supplements nootropics but again i would not just buy things off the shelves and try to understand first to regulate certain pathways that will impact the brain rather than optimizing it uh with a specific product like uh, um, i don't know GABA or all this sort of thing. So yeah, uh, and sometimes working uh, with a practitioner when we have certain gene variants and we have brain fogs and we have, is a good idea. So we can really get to the source of things and the platform help for that. Hope it makes sense. Anything to add, Anna? Um, I was, I mean, we've had a question that um, I thought would be prudent to answer now. Yeah. Um, and that's actually, it's a little bit of a, a tangent, but it's just talking about, um, Kind of how we would determine um, what SNPs to include um, in a report for an individual. So, mm -hmm. just kind of a, I'm just, I just wanted to kind of pull out here. So, the way that we do it at Omnos is what you can see here is the kind of a, a cluster of different um, of different genes. So, we'll look at um, detoxification, for example, as an entire pathway and there's an entire group of genes so we won't just say you know you've got this one gene and therefore you know you can't detoxify the wrong way of doing it <laughs> exactly we want to try and show you that actually there's you know there's multiple um genes that 
some have higher strength of evidence than others um because some are more reported on and more are researched but if you then if you can look at a, um, a group of them then you can understand better how this person is going to be responding um but what we can um and um, julia the question's from you but it, you know if, there, if there's some um further information you'd like on that obviously drop it in the chat um but also kind of going back to the brain health um uh, recommendations and, and genes so it can even be things like you know, we know that vitamin D, vitamin D, for example, is, a, is an important factor for brain health as, as one thing. So if we can look at um, genes related to your vitamin D, again, we can say, OK, this person is um, going to potentially need higher supplementation of vitamin D. So and then, you, and then obviously you can look at pulling in their blood markers as well. OK, this person is actually also low in their vitamin D, which isn't surprising considering their genes are um uh, impact if you have the two combination of vdr genes you're really yeah. likely to be low and you will be low if you are in winter not supplementing for example or yeah. not actually before supplementing trying to get sun exposure is the best way of getting vitamin yeah. d right usually natural ways are better first <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to come back on the question of, of Julia uh, very quickly, um, it, it's very important to understand that we do have uh, um, self-regulation within OMNOS because when we when I started actually all this ten years ago, there was no regulation whatsoever, and still not enough to be honest. Uh, and and we make sure that everything is scientifically validated, and within the platform, on each SNPs you have the link to the exact um research paper um, and we don't just give uh, it's not a, just a snippedia link which is the sort of uh, wikipedia of uh, genes but really goes into uh, the depth of, of you know the research so it, it's different research um yeah and um yeah so just think on, on this um now let's talk about detoxification so I don't like this word detoxification, but uh, because it's really about biotransformation. So it's getting toxins um, in your body and defying them and then making them sort of water soluble uh, have to be removed through other pathways. And you have sort of seven pathways. Phase one and two are the most important because they, they are determining of the others. Uh, seven pathways, what you do pretty much in the toilets, right? So, um, or the sweat or whatever. But the, the, the phase one is identifying what needs to be removed in your body and, 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 and mostly. And phase two, uh, let's say like uh, the GSTM1 I was talking earlier, uh, there's... Uh, um, uh, glutathione, which is a molecule, uh, a super antioxidant that will bind to a molecule that didn't do very well. I'm simplifying all this, right? Because all this can be complicated, but didn't do very well in the phase one detoxification and now ended up in phase two. And glutathione will bind this molecule to make it water soluble. So then it can be transported out of your body. Um, and if you do have GSTM1 being a high risk variant in the sense that you it's not an enzyme that work optimally. Uh, you don't have the lucky draw on these genes, let's say. You have less glutathione in your body to start with. So you're quite living in a city like London, for example, you'll be a lot more challenged um, with this and you're quite likely to be low. So then you're quite likely to have more toxins in your body, which will create more inflammation. Uh, and and other things and if you are let's say overweight you don't sweat or you know because you, you don't you know, you're sedentary uh, those uh, toxins will actually uh, bound into your, your your fat tissues and this is where can things start to go wrong because you can create inflammation and you know all this sort of thing so this is how it works and this is all sort of genes uh, in phase one some are has to do on how you're going to process certain um medicine even like uh, uh, there's pharmacogenomics as well which we, we do also within the, the platform when you use genes is understanding how you you process certain um, medicine because from a person to another again it's very different um, there's uh, methylation genes um, so yeah uh, phase one and phase two um, and 
let's have a look at the recommendation. Things you can do, obviously, the first thing, if you don't have the lucky draws in, in those genetic variants, the thing that you should be doing first is to remove as much as possible the things you can control in your environment. So for example, processed food will have tons of pesticides, tons of things that you don't really want to have in your body, um, but will be toxic, will create uh, you know, a reaction. So you want to remove that. Then you want to try to eat things as much as organic as possible, if you can, without the pesticide. Uh, there's a list, for example, <clears throat> the dirty uh, dozen, um, which gives you the, the, the vegetables and, and fruits that are most likely to have pesticide. Try to avoid those lists uh, to have them non-organic because you're quite likely to have a, a lot of pesticide for them. But then it's not only the food, it's your environment. It's hard, obviously, to control if you're in a city like London, the car fumes and all those things. But you can maybe control the food, the product that you will put on your skin, for example, the 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 food. Uh, I mean, the things you will have in your cabinets, in your in your cleaning cabinet. They all have their fair of, of toxic loads. So try to avoid those things and and swap for more friendly, toxin friendly uh, product. Then things to take. You can, uh, you know, all sorts of glutathione. You know. Uh, um, precursor to that, there's certain enzyme like uh, <clears throat> DIM, like uh, sulfurofan um, uh, that you will find in certain things like uh, allium, uh, broccoli. Uh, so the alliums of the garlic and onions, for example, broccoli will have DIM and sulfurofan. Uh, those things are to help you support your detoxification pathways. They will help to, to create those enzymes like glutathione. <laughs> Yeah, so just kind of the on the sulfurophane. So that was something um, that um, I was looking into recently. And just we were talking earlier about how um, certain things can switch on or off genes. Now, yeah. what they found is something like sulfurophane, which is found in, um, like Tom said, broccoli and basically cruciferous vegetables, vegetables yeah. I can't say it. No, Brussels sprouts, sprouts. Um, but basically by having that in the diet can actually help to switch on a cascade of your detoxification and yeah. en um, genes and enzymes essentially so yeah. there are certain things that can really help to support your body uh, even if you have got genetic variations that mean that you have a lower um, yeah. detoxification system um, one caveat I would say, which I found out, the reason I was looking at it, um, is that you have to have um, the sulfurophane in the raw version. So, for example, raw broccoli, that sort of thing. I hate raw yep. broccoli. So and I've got. I've, caveat I've, is... say I've started um, grating broccoli into my salads because that's the only way I can. I will eat, will eat yeah. it. Um, and it, another caveat here is if you do have um, predisposition to fire age issue and you're, you, you're sort of already been diagnosed with thyroid issue, you should avoid cruciferous vegetables um, because this will challenge your, your thyroid even more. Um, but anyway, yeah, in terms of, yeah, things you can take uh, to this quite a lot. And again, um, when you do a genetic test for the platform, we give you all the recommendation attached to it. We're going to have a look at all this after. Inflammation. Inflammation is another really important one because really, we know that inflammation is the source of most issues, right? Um, however, inflammation is a normal um, protective response of your body. So let's say I'm going to cut myself, um, I'll, it will create inflammation. And that's uh, an alarm system of the body for repair, right? Um, however, when the inflammation becomes chronic, this is where the issue uh, is really. Um, and chronic inflammation just means that your body is in constant alarm system. Um, so imagine, let's say, you know, we are in the office and you have the alarm going on, you have to leave out the office, uh, you know, test of alarm. It's pretty much the same in your body. So the, the main, the things like repairing methylation, which is uh, repairing your, your cells and I mean your DNA and all these different things are being left out. Um, and it can, you know, your gut will be damaged, your, you will not absorb nutrient properly. So chronic inflammation is, is very uh, a thing you want to avoid. 
So um, there's a lot of genes that predispose you again to having this inflammation, a cas cascade of inflammation. And actually we know from most people who now have long COVID or, or people who have had a bad reaction to COVID, it has to do a lot to do with inflammation genes as well. So we do report on, on those things, not, not under the COVID genes, we don't call them this way, but yeah, it's very important to, to understand. Um, the things you can do about inflammation, first is having, again, a pro-anti-inflammatory diet, um, which will be, again, the omega 3 so all the sort of cold fish are very good for pro-anti-inflammatory. Remove inflammation that you will get from, you can get inflammation from certain type of food um, that you are intolerant to, for example, lactose intolerance will create an inflammation response. Um, and gluten, if you're intolerant, will create an, in, an inflammation response. And all those things will disturb your gut. You can be uh, certain parasites will create inflammations. So yeah, it, it's it's overall, right? Um, alcohol, obviously, obvious, right? So all those things will create an inflammation response. And if it becomes chronic, um, in the long term, it can really alter your health, starting by your guts, having uh, leaky guts, that's chronic inflammation, and then you just don't absorb you know, nutrients properly, and actually it can long term run into um, autoimmune diseases uh, and, and all sorts of problems. So we don't want to go down this route, so we want to prevent those things. What are the imbalances that you may have that can create inflammation long term? How can you rectify all this? Uh, this is more about uh, finding out what are all those imbalances. So um, low vitamin D, for example, uh, with um, high cholesterol, high triglyceride, all those things together can create inflammation. So our blood markers will tell you whether you are already have uh, inflammation or not. Uh, and our gene test will, will tell you whether you're predisposed to that. Um, but yeah, it's important to, it's a good one to, to, to you know, to, to get rid of chronic inflammation for sure. Uh, overtraining as well can be uh, not recovering enough and create inflammation and, and you know, for athletes uh, and, and create more likelihood of injuries, for example, or gut health problem or hormone imbalances, which is very common for athletes. Yeah, anything you want to add here? No, all good. All good. So this one, insulin resistance, um, it's very important, it's type two diabetes, we talk a lot about this, um, and insulin sensitivity is obviously um, your response to insulin, right? But you can be predisposed again on how you're going to respond to that. And this is a few genes here, we talked about FTO, the obesity genes, uh, this is to do with how you're going to do with uh, sugar intake and all these different things. Um, and the things to do, obviously, here is you don't want to spike your insulin if you are predisposed to have um, type 2 diabetes or, or those genes to express. You want to make sure that you regulate your insulin and you work on your what we call your metabolic flexibility. Uh, things like intermittent fasting can be useful here uh, if, if, if you can do it. Um, but also, most importantly, is eating food that are low, have a low glycemic index. So instead of white carbs, go for like sweet potatoes, for example, uh, and, and making sure you have proteins, a lot of fibers, all of those things will help to regulate insulin. Um, there's for things like, you know, uh, we know that works uh, before a meal, for example, uh, apple cider vinegars or these sort of things, but you do want to avoid anyway, um, the high, let's, high starch food that will spike your insulin, um, the sodas and all, all the obvious junk food um, that will, you know, uh, not dysregulate your insulin and potentially uh, uh, lead you to type 2 diabetes, especially if you have those gene variation and especially if it's already uh, within the family. Yeah, it's very important. Um, yeah, anything to, to add, Hannah? Um, no, I think you were going to show us the um, how that looks on. Um, yeah, so I, I will I will show you how it looks on the platform. But before that, just here as a slide, is the result overview. This is how we we give the results. 
Um, and then we explain what those things means and what is your variation, I mean, what is for you. And then obviously we give all the personalized recommendation on um, things to do, things to avoid, and it's always explained. So it's all about educating you to make the, the, the right changes that count, right? Um, now, let me see how I can uh, go on the platform here. Everybody see my screen here, genetics? What can you see? Still see your... Um... Okay, so I need to stop sharing and I will do mm -hmm. another share here. There we go. So you can see here genetics. So those are all the genetic results. Um, there's different score, there's a score breakdown. This is how it looks on the platform. Um, if I were to go into weight management, for example, um, I have type two diabetes here because uh, all those genes will have a massive impact on uh, how you can lose weight or not. Um, and I will click on that. This is high, okay? It's not very high, but it's high. We explain what this is, okay? Um, your result means that you're likely to develop type 2 diabetes. And, and this is a different uh, subcategories related to that. And this is all the different genes here with glucose level. And if you want to look at any of those genes here, so let's say one, you know, FTO, we explain what that gene here is. The SNP, okay, you remember the SNP? This is the position on your gene, your type. This is um, your base pair, your AA, that makes, makes you high risk for these genes, okay? So that does mean, mean that you're, yeah, you, you're not expressing that very well. So, and here you have the research. I'll, I'll click here because it was a question, but we go directly into the research paper. So for those who really wanna dig in, it's all here and we link always the science, yeah? So going back here. But what is important is when things are very high or high, this is where we start recommending things. Uh, possible symptoms, maybe this is symptoms you have actually reported to us when you were doing your questionnaire. And then we we'll tell you the things to do. So for example, eat more low glycemic food, like I, I explained, and we give you example of what they are, right? Um, and well, here this, plenty of reason why this person should do this because there's different type of result but because we link everything in the platform so that's of a reason why this person should should actually eat low glycemic food right so there's a lot of reason why here uh, and this is from another test carbohydrate rate being very high so this means that actually this gene is expressing right so it's actually the, the uh, this test was not a genetic test it's show that um yeah, yeah it's expressing what is predisposed to. So now we need to do this to correct all those things. Okay. And this is how the platform works really. So we always will advise you on things to do, things to avoid, or people to see if you want to have help. Right. Um, so yeah, this is the, the, the obvious one. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more. Uh, and just for, for those who, who don't have any results um, on the genetic tests, this is all the things we we look for so we talked about detoxification for example is the same it's here um all the genes in relation to detoxification the those that you are high um gstm1 here the one we mentioned glutathione and this is all the things we should do so we talk about we didn't mention actually well sulfurofans from sulfur food um allium intake uh, all those different things right uh, things to avoid things to see here, when it's just based on genetic, we rarely recommend uh, supplements. But when we know it's actually something that, when it's more like um, the, our functional test, but it's something that say you're low in vitamin D, we might recommend you with the vitamin D, and then you can buy the supplements directly. So this is how it works. Because here it doesn't tell us that actually you are expressing the gene or not. So we rather recommend you the food or things to do and educate you about it. So I hope this helps um, and it shows a bit all the different things here. Uh, yeah, and here vitamin D be, being very high, I mentioned uh, certain uh, VDL genes here. Um, so yeah, there we go. So I say, well, thank you, Thomas. Um, I I think it's time for us to quickly go over some of the questions. Yes. Um, we've got a couple that we had on Instagram, so we'll go over that as well. But um, the first one was um, 
a question from Samantha saying, um, how long does it take to change or reverse bad choices or influence gene makeup? I think that's quite a... Um, yeah, a, it really uh, depends, right? So <laughs> it, re it really depends where you are. And, and, and again, it's, it's coming back to um, where you are now, where you want to be that's your personal journey and it's very different from a person to another and what is for you uh being acceptable of being optimal your version of being you know functioning optimally um and i think it's very important to already ident identify this sorry um and then if you want to go more specific uh then it's, it's, it's tracking right so let's say Okay, so for example, of the, the all the, of the blood markers to come back on, on the simple things, uh, VDR genes, vitamin D, um, I'm being deficient in vitamin D. Um, I we report on optimal level. I want to reach that level, so I will make sure I maybe expose myself to the sun a, a lot more, um, go out as much as possible, take a supplement during winter. Um, and then I will will track and see again if I within this optimal range I want to be. So let's say above seventy five or more. Um, th this is, yeah, th this is my answer because it's it's, <laughs> it's hard to say you know without knowing the the, the yeah the context yeah. Uh, the lifestyle is very important. That's why okay. we have a really long self assessment because we understand all those things. I think kind of going into reversing or influencing genetic makeup, it really does depend because some, you know, there are certain genes that you can influence the expression of them, um, but I don't think we can necessarily put a time frame on that. Um, but that being said, um, there are, you can't, you, you kind of add these tags to your genes throughout your life. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the negative ones can actually, you know, actually then be, um, so something, for example, smoking can actually then be passed on to, you know, children, grandchildren, that sort of thing. So there's, there isn't, it's quite difficult to put an, an exact um, time frame on that, to be completely honest with you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that might change with, with evidence. So because another thing I'd like to say is that um, evidence within this area is constantly changing, increasing, improving. Right. Um, so this, this is now, why we, we, we have month. actually this month starting a, um, a, a geneticist, a graduate in genetic to to really go further down the line of um, you know in in going through the old science again, uh, adding polygenetic scoring properly. Um, so, you know we, we keep changing this. It's also to uh, answer one of the question here. Uh, we're more than happy to to share how we we process all those criteria and how we do it. Um, yeah, and and the people we hire to do so. Yeah. So uh, uh, and the next question from Deb was about um, searching um, Omnos for something like Apoe. Um, so that's actually going to be coming very soon as a search function for specific genes. Yeah. Um, right now you would have to go into the different clusters, um, but that's going to yeah, be so in Heart wellness and lipid metabolism, this is where you will find APOE. Um, I could maybe uh, share that, uh, but yeah, this is where you will, you will, you will see that. Um, or blood pressure as well, depending on everything that affects it. Um, and then, um, uh, a couple more questions so there's one um from from mike um who was coming off as julia um so what do we do with the genetic information we collect from people this is actually quite similar to another question that we had around how safe is our um the dna and data in our hands um i'll let you thomas um answer this in more detail but um one thing julia is that it is, sorry, Mike, is that it is, um, you know, it is all safe. We're not going to be selling it to insurance companies, yeah. anything like that. Um, so one, one thing that I want to make clear uh, as founder of Omnos, one, one thing that when I first started was all about data ownership because there, there is company out there that will take your data and sell it. Um, and that's their business model. Um, and I'm against this <laughs> uh, because those are valuable data that could be used for purposeful research 
Um, and anyway, it's your genetic, it's your data, just like any other data, any other health data. And we're all about data ownership. And we are working hard on making sure that you have all this data ownership. But in the long term, you could even potentially yourself have the choice whether you want to trade with data because actually health data are uh, a very fast growing asset. Um, but yeah, it's to a more type of bringing this back to the people. And you know, the mission here is to democratize health and decentralizing health and data ownership is, is, is a big part of it. So yeah, we will never sell your data you know, to a third. That was my very long version of answering this, but <laughs> yes, I hope it helps. Um, and then we had another question. Um, can I mean, I think some people would have potentially seen this on the dashboard that we've just gone through, but can addiction be detected? Yeah, so I mean, addiction again, like you are predisposed, and there's a lot of genes to do with dopamine pathways like DRD1, D3, D4. Uh, all those genes has to do with how you're going to react to triggers. Um, and if your lifestyle, your environment, especially, you know, in, in the sense of like alcohol addiction and drugs, they, they play on those genes. If you express, you're quite more likely to be addicted to that. Um, if addiction runs in the family as well, because of those genes, it's also you know expressing already so you, you do need to yeah it, it short short answer yes you will see the predisposition but again it's the lifestyle the the, the diet the environment um and there's a lot of to do with psychology here on how you can correct all this mm. great um i think that's all the questions um that we've had yeah uh, so yeah um good. great good. a bit more than an hour but it's all good yes um, as i say we um i'm sure th this topic i could talk about forever um there's lots yeah. more things that we, i'd like to we discuss. actually have the the academy we will do a full course uh, that will be available uh, for anybody to join to learn really in depth and we go through each and every single genes each area what they are uh, in a very simple manner um, and that is something that we're hoping the course is to launch in quarter four this year um, but before that there will be a lot more webinar about different things but then there will be a pro version of this course for practitioners and and, and the public version uh, which is really understanding uh, everything about genetic and what you can do about it yeah good Okay. Well, well, thank, thank you, you very much, everyone, for being here. Um, and I'm sure we will email a little code for all the participants, um, for the ones who do not have yet uh, uh, done the test and they want to try it out. And yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Take care.